Welcome to Tea and Tales. Now, some of you have come to every Tea and Tales, so thank you for supporting the program. This is the seventh one. And we want to start by acknowledging that this program is taking place in the unceded territory of Little Watt Nation. My name is Nikki Madigan, and I'm the curator at the museum. And just a reminder to everyone that we do film these presentations for the record, and we'll put an edited version up on the website. Our theme this year is local art, past and present. So what is art? Art is defined as the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination and includes the various branches of creative activity such as painting, music, literature and dance. Why is art important? Art reflects and informs the culture from which it emerges. Art created reflects a time and a place and the values and beliefs of that place. Art can be considered a mirror that is held up to inspire reflection on what is and what was. Art can communicate thoughts and ideas across generations. In the past, local art wasn't the exception, it was the reality. Communicating and growing beyond local boundaries was largely impossible. Today we can communicate with nearly anyone, anytime. But it's local art that gives a community meaning and a sense of place, so it remains an important aspect of any community. Integrating the arts more fully into our lives enriches each of us because engaging in the arts brings individuals together and it fosters community. We've all gathered together here this summer to enjoy and appreciate local art. We started with some of the traditional arts of Little Watt Nation with Lois Joseph, Vera Edmonds, and Jonathan Joe, who demonstrated the arts of regalia making, carving, and basket weaving. Wim Twinkle is a well-known local artist and a creative force, and he explained his artistic journey and encouraged all of us to explore the artist within us. Eric Anderson took us along Emily Carr's journey through the Sea to Sky by Rail in 1933, and we explored her iconic images of Pemberton and area. Johnny Jones shared his expert knowledge about the oldest art form in the valley, Little Watt Rock paintings, and showed us how art transcends generations. Levi Nelson, a young, talented Little Watt artist who is pursuing a degree in visual arts through Emily Carr University, shared his personal journey as an artist and frankly blew our socks off with the versatility and the beauty of his art. And last week, Linda K. Thompson took us on a romp through her childhood memories of the valley through her stories and poems, and we all agreed it was a wonderful way to spend a Tuesday afternoon. Today's program features the museum supervisor, Teresa Smith, who has some special connections to the museum and one of the artists we're going to feature today in this tale. Teresa moved back to Pemberton this summer and we're lucky to have her with us. Teresa is also a genealogy guide for those looking into their family histories and has prepared some excellent research on the three artists we're highlighting today, Pat Wilson, Reenie Ronan, and Marjorie Gims. I want to give a special thank you to all the bakers that helped make the program possible over the last seven weeks. It's a hot time of year to be baking, but thank you to Annette Gordon and Dana, Fran Cuthbert, Anna's Cake Kitchen, Peggy Perfett, Roland Midgley, Katie Dorian, Connie Sobchak, Burke and Bakery, Heidi Kim Leverhar, Betty Mercer, Carol Morphy, Carmen Crane, and Judy McNulty. And thank you all for supporting the program. Hello, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikki, for a lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Teresa Smith, and I am the museum supervisor here this year. Um, as Nikki said, I came back for the season uh, after leaving for 20 years. Amazing what happens when you leave for 20 years. Things change. Some things don't. <laughs> So um, I am here to present a little on uh, Pat Wilson, Rini Ronan, and Marjorie Gims. Um, so we'll start with uh, Pat Wilson. And we're going to start with Pat Wilson because he, um, he started out here in 1908. He was born in England. He came from an Irish family. So Pat was uh, a young boy. He grew up in a, in a home called East Court. And when I looked into that, it was actually quite a large home. And he was the son of a doctor. 
So Dr. Uh, Richard Mervin and his wife Nora uh, had a family of a bunch of boys and, and a daughter. Um, so as the son of a doctor, he was expected to have an education. Uh, and he went to school to become an electrical engineer. Uh, he had an older brother who had gone uh, over to Canada before. And uh, school was kind of not as fun as he thought it would be. So when his brother told him of the wilds of Pemberton, he decided to check it out. So he packed his bags and he headed to Canada. Um, and he became a farmer with his brother up the Pemberton Valley. Um, he was able to always capture the valley in his art. And we do have some pieces of his art here on display. Um, we do have one here that came in today as a, a loan for the day. It's called Two Cedars Ranch. And it would be the WC Green home at the top of the valley. Um, and again, in the winter. We do have a few more that uh, we'll talk about as well. So in this photo, uh, Pat Wilson is in a photo with Bussy Green, who would have been uh, his friend Dick's sister. Um, and, and Dick are also there. Uh, that would be those her children, the smaller children. Um, on the side. So the Pat, uh, he loved to paint, um, and you may notice that a lot of his subject matter was in fact the W.C. Green Farm. Here we have another painting of the Green's home that would have been in this painting and next to this painting. So it does seem like he spent quite a lot of time at the Green Farm. This building uh, was built in 1920. Uh, and is located on the Meadows Road, across from Green Road. Uh, and uh, it says it's no longer in existence. So, and he painted this one in 1930. So it's a beautiful painting. It really does capture the mountainside and sort of that way the mountain is able to hold the clouds on that side. Um, I believe that's the wet side of the valley. So it doesn't quite work as well with the with the clouds. His painting, Mountain Meadow, was given to my uh, great aunt, uh, Cecil Gims, on her 18th birthday. She had just emigrated to Canada uh, and she uh, was a lover of Tanquil um, and she absolutely loved it up there. And so this is believed to be Tanquil or somewhere along the way to Tanquil. Um, and uh, he had painted that for her in 1930. Uh, again, quite a nice valley picture. And this doesn't really, the, the slide doesn't give a justice. So it is here on the, um, the easel. And it sadly has a little bit of damage to it. And hopefully one day we can uh, get repairs on that. Big knock. But uh, yes, it was definitely something that was... Uh, I'm sure loved deeply. Uh, he was an artist until the end. Um, Pat died during the Second World War. And in his kit, there would have been a inventory of everything that you had in your possession in your kit when you passed away. Uh, so within that, I didn't add all of his kit, but I did in, in fact add some very important things. Uh, seven paintbrushes three pencils, one package of drawing paper, three oil paintings, four books on drawing, one photograph album with watercolor paintings, one block of watercolor paper wrapped in brown paper, and three small painting dishes. So as you can imagine, uh, as a deployed soldier, he would be expected to carry his kit everywhere he went. You were given everything you had, you took with you, when you were deployed, you took it with you to the next spot and the next spot. Um, and since he passed away in France, he would have also had to take it to France with him. So looking at that, I would say these were very important things to him. Um, in order to keep those things on his person, he would have had to keep carrying them across a couple of continents uh, in order to uh, keep them with him. So uh, they do believe that he was in fact, a uh, wartime portraiture as well, uh, which would be um, 
parts that we never did see these albums uh, or the watercolor paintings or the three oil paintings. They were bequeathed to his mother who was living in Ireland at the time. So his brother would not have received them, so they didn't come back to the Pembroke Valley. They would have gone back to Ireland, um, and we don't have a record of that. Uh, he joined uh, the 28th Armoured Regiment, uh, which is the British Columbia Regiment, and the 4th Armoured Brigade, and the 4th Armoured Division. Uh, so he would have gone with them from BC here, there, and still in downtown Vancouver, um, and he would have done all of his training throughout Canada, and then deployed over to England, continued his training for a couple of years there, uh, and he made it to the rank of sergeant. Uh, he also actually went up one step, I believe it was, uh, I cannot remember the rank, uh, and he asked to be demoted. So he didn't want to stay at that rank, I guess he was given too many things to do, or didn't want to have that. So he, he actually asked that he go back down a, a rank to sergeant. So. Uh, he is here, this is the Book of Remembrance, this is the, the National Book, and he's on the top line. So, uh, he was pretty, uh, Sergeant Wilson Patrick Godfrey Mervyn, and he was uh, joined on Ju June 21st, 1940. Next slide. Uh, Pat was killed August 9th, 1944 in Normandy, and is buried at Brayettville, Sterlais, the Canadian War Cemetery. Uh, I can never say this, Sanko. Department of Cub de Cogos. That's Normandy, France. So he is in Normandy. Uh, it was a huge battle for his division. Uh, it is still, when you look up his division and his entire regiment, they discuss the battle that he died in. Um, on, it's one of those battles that just was a turning point for the war. So they did lose a lot of people that day, uh, but he was in a decisive uh, battle, and, and you know, at least he, he came from that. Um, Pat did leave a legacy of paintings of the area. Uh, he's also on the cairn in front of the Legion. Uh, so if you go over there, you can see that he's actually still there. Um, each one of his paintings, to me, really represents the softness of the valley as well. When you look at his paintings, they do try to show the brightness of the valley and the softness. It's not just, you know, cold and hard. And when you look at the years that he would have been here, this is pre-road. This is pre-power. This is pre, well, we had the railway, but that's about it. <laughs> um, so really, it would have been a time of hardship. And when I look at his paintings, I don't see that. You, you don't see that. You know, this was hard and we didn't like it. Uh, there's a lot of love in those paintings. Um, so Pat was a pretty uh, incredible guy uh, and he did pass away. I do uh, understand that he was great friends uh, with Dick Green and maybe, you know, those are the reasons we've got so many page pictures of, of the Green House. Uh, he did have three sisters. <laughs> um, all right, so moving on. Does anybody have any questions about that? I've got everything. Uh, I just wanted to say Rosemary Walden had told us Pat also donated the lands that the Upper Valley Cemetery are on. <laughs> so that's a permanent legacy that Pat left in the valley as well. <coughs> all right, Rainy Ronan. Uh, Isabel Irene Ronan, born on November 20th, 1901, in Ireland. Uh, she died on July 22nd, 1974, in Williams Lake. Uh, this is a great shot of her and her siblings, Rini, John, and Daisy. It's one of my most favorite pictures, actually, of the Pemberton for some reason. Daisy in the basket, just, suits. just so cute. Uh, and then Rini on the side there. Rini's art came naturally to her. Her parents saw her natural talents and gave her a few lessons in Vancouver. She did live in Vancouver as an adult and used to sell her pictures at Stanley Park. Um, she did grow up in the valley and her dad, John, had a passion for learning and taught all of his children Latin, flora, fauna, geography. Um, but Rini herself would have only attended school until about grade seven. 
uh, because that's all that was available in the area. So she would have had to be self-educated after that time. So grade seven would have really been about as far as she could go. And she wanted to be a journalist, so she did uh, continue writing. Um, some pictures of the groups. They did a lot of community events. And uh, so a couple here, she's, uh, my throat here. So she's here in the white dress. And again, here in the center. Um, so they always had quite a few events and picnics. Um, all of these are, are called picnic pictures. Um, we do have quite a few in the area. Um, her cousin Ethel Pretoria was also a painter and did beautiful watercolors of flowers and uh, tinting of, of photographs taken in the valley. Um, we have two examples of that. These are both black and white photos that have been tinted. Um, so the, the technique that would have had to be painstakingly painted um, to color the painting or the drawing. So both of these uh, portraits would have been uh, tinted. Which to me, when I first looked at them, I just thought they were faded photographs, but no, in fact, they are tinted. And she also had two aunts in Ireland that were well-known artists. So she did, did come naturally. Uh, Rini was a real Renaissance woman for her time. I mean, she was independent, she really was creative, and she had a love for Pemberton that shines through her art and her writings about home. She did a lot of writing. Um, here's a couple of paintings that she did um, in oil from uh, TF snapshot of the lake between Sioux and Rutherford River. Oil painting on cork or cardboard. Uh, it's quite, they're quite small, they're not huge. Um, and then the view of Lillouet from E. Bronin. Oil painting on plywood. So, it's an, and she uses different mediums, but you know, at the end she does have a beautiful painting. And I love her clouds. here. These, build, these two paintings are in the Chance building. Uh, she, they're quite large. Uh, she was an artist and a journalist. She never married and she lived in Pemberton and Vancouver. So these two paintings were done as a trio. There is a third painting we do not have um, and I'm not too positive on what that painting was but I do believe uh, it was more of a central picture. Uh, there is an old picture we do have that does show the pictures in at the potato show which they were made for but you can't clearly see what that third painting is so we know it existed um, we do have record of it but we don't know what it is so we have Pemberton Meadows looking south and Pemberton Meadows looking north and it does appear that she just did this and this <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's about right uh, one's a little further distant than the other so it does look like she just stood in the same place and turned around uh, but uh, it's a great capture of the valley for sure. Uh, and she did have very light work as well, so great images of the mountain at the very back. Good use of color. Uh, Rini was commissioned to paint a mural for the Permanent Board of Trade. Uh, to exhibit in agriculture fairs and other special occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, as you see on the bottom, there's the uh, celebration of the novel train, I believe, and you can see the banner and how large it is being put up at the front of the hotel. Uh, so it's quite a large banner. It is, uh, unfortunately, we have a nice book today, but it is quite frail, so we can't pull it out of the archive room. Um, but it is tucked away and safe. Uh, I love that the, the centerpiece of this painting potato. is the potato. Um, it's a little shiny, unfortunately, the photograph, but you can see you've got so many aspects of what the valley is made of. Um, the salmon, the potato, the fields, the mountains, the workers. Um, it really does try and capture every little piece. The cattle. And is that corn? Um, so you've got all of these pieces that she's put into one, and it does appear almost like a map in the center and the bottom. It is a map yeah. of the trails. Too. Yeah, so you've got sort of a little bit of everything showing you where, where everything is. 
and they're nicely cut into each other so you don't lose one without going into the other. Um, and as an artist, that's actually quite difficult. So that would be, that's a pretty amazing technique that she's been able to incorporate literally, I think it's about 10 paintings into one painting. Because uh, each cutaway is a painting in its own right. So that would be W.C. Bennett at the Pemberton Hotel, possibly celebration for the inaugural train. So it would have been a great painting to pull out and show off Pemberton. So beyond Garibaldi, so she published a book. She thought, hey, let's write about something. Um, it's very interesting. I have finished reading it. Uh, I do recommend it if you've ever uh, got a copy. I don't know if the library has any more. Uh, maybe there's a copy there. I know Mr. Amazon has a couple. Uh, published in 1971, Rini gives us a glimpse into the way of life in Pemberton for young pioneers. She credits her father's teaching and his way to lead us, reach for the top in all things cultural, material, or sorry, and material, regardless of background difficulties. When we were in our growing youth, he made up, made up to us for what we lacked in normal recreation and fun by teaching us to find entertainment beyond the round of daily tasks of pioneer life in a love of the outdoors, its interests, and beauties. So you can imagine as a pioneer child, she would not have had an easy okay, it's just time to go play. Uh, there were no PS4s and gaming consoles. Um, there was firewood, dishes, and food. Um, having grown up on a farm myself in a modern time, I can only imagine the difficulties in which she would have had to go through. Um, recreation would not have been, you know, an easy thing to come by. Extra time and fun, even as a child, would have been difficult. So. Uh, she was pretty helpful around her farm as well, as the oldest daughter, um, and I do believe she did most of the cooking. So, she did write a book, it's a great, good, it's a great read, it is of its time, um, and then in the 1970s, just a few things have changed since then, but um, it's a great read for, uh, for those of you that are interested. Uh, and she's got some great illustrations. My favorite one, which I didn't, but was of the wild women. The little wet. Um, they, they giggle at sketching, but it's great. Um, she does, uh, you know, quite a few drawings. And I wish I'd actually got the picture of the cover and the back, because this painting continues onto the back of the book. Um, and so she really did, as every opportunity that she had within the book, there's a sketch or a drawing, or every title page is a painting or a drawing done by Rini. So it was uh, quite quite interesting. Um, and on the next page, we've got May 24th picnic at Agerton. Second from the left, Rini Ronan. Who knows where Agerton is? That's that's uh, in its corner. So the corner disappeared. It used to be a whole town <laughs> a long time ago. Looks great then. Lots of people. I think we saw about that many at our schoolhouse stomp. <laughs> um, so Rini unfortunately passed away in 1974 unexpectedly. She was visiting family in Williams Lake and she's believed to have suffered a heart attack, which is quite sad. But uh, she was with family. And uh, hopefully, you know, we could have picnics like that now. A nice little hat. And she does have some beautiful paintings. So we've got some paintings of Greenies here in oil. Uh, and then she's got these absolutely gorgeous leaves. So if you, when you come afterwards and come take a look, uh, the technique of blowing leaves across a painting is quite difficult um, to just depict wind in something you feel versus you see. Um, it's quite a, a hard technique. Uh, so she does have these two beautiful paintings. This is somewhere I would believe to be on the coast of BC, as it looks quite similar to quite a coast. Um, but yeah, on this painting here, she's got oil and there's little leaves across the entire painting, um, which is beautiful uh, and very difficult to do. So uh, an example of using different mediums, you know, sketching in her book, she did pen and ink, painting, oils, and watercolors, and the two big paintings in the Sean's house are in fact pastels. I'm not mistaken. Are they watercolor? I could be. 
I could be correct. Um, so she did have some pretty incredible points, and she did work with more than one medium. But I do recommend reading the uh, Beyond Garibaldi, as it does have some quite interesting stories in it. Um, Marge again. Well, this one's pretty easy for me. I'm not going to say no. Uh, this is my grandmother. So I do know a little bit more about it just because I grew up knowing all of the stories. Uh, Marjorie Gims was born on April 1st, uh, 1925 in Lillooet. She was the youngest of three children. And she died on April 25th, 1996 uh, in North Vancouver. Uh, Marjorie's family came from England. And uh, she was born in Canada, but they were returned to England to, to grow up there for a bit. Um, and they lived in a place called Springfield in Lillooet. Uh, Springfield Plate Gardens in Lillooet was named for the home at the bottom here, which was Springfield Place. Uh, this was Marjorie's family home in England. Um, they were there until about the age of almost eight, when Marjorie's grandmother reminded her mother it was time for Marjorie to be sent to boarding school. Marjorie was promptly packed up and brought back to Canada. As her mother was like, mm, nope, I don't think I want her going to boarding school. Um, so she returned her to Canada. Um, so this is just shortly after they arrived in England with her mother and her grandmother in the doorway of Springfield Place. Um, I was there recently in 2017 and it looks just like the bottom photo. So it is now three homes. Uh, but it is a gorgeous estate. She was born to Jeffrey and Winifred Downton of Lillooet. Mr. Downton was the, he saw the potential of the Bridge River Project, so he was the guy who uh, immigrated to the area with his wife so that he could pursue the Bridge River Project in the Seton area. Um, he noticed it in 1912 and returned in 1919 after the Second World War, or First World War, sorry. Uh, it wasn't until after the Second World War that the bridge project was able to go off the ground. Um, but uh, nevertheless, they, they did go forward and go uh, forward quite well. Uh, Marjorie was married to Gunnar Gims. Uh, they had six children. She always drew, she always painted, and she wrote um, quite a lot. Uh, most of her writings are not allowed to be out yet in my family. Says, no, that's all hers still. Uh, but she never stopped writing. And uh, hopefully one day she wrote a, a story. It was a, a letter to my brother on your 70th birthday. Uh, her brother suddenly passed away during the Second World War. He was killed in action. So on his 70th birthday, she wrote him a story about life. Um, and it's one of my favorite pieces because she really does sort of look at their life as it would have been had he survived the war. Um, here's a beautiful photo of their wedding day. Um, my grandmother and grandfather, and this is their 50th wedding anniversary. That would have been in the early 90s. Or, yeah. So they, uh, they were quite the cute couple. Uh, the painting on the top was her mother's drawing of Marjorie. So Marjorie's family were artists as well. Um, she, this is about this big, and um, I had to blow it up to get a good picture of it. So if you can imagine, it's quite small, and the detail that would have gone into that um, was quite intensive. So she would have um, always preferred to draw, paint, or garden. Many of you knew her for her gardening skills. Uh, she never enjoyed cooking as much. She, she did learn. but. She, she was always would rather paint or draw and, uh, and or write and garden. So very creative, not necessarily with dinner. But uh, <laughs> she, uh, she did, she became an amazing cook. Marjorie was uh, involved with the museum from its inception, um, holding a position of society president. So uh, when the museum was looking for ideas for a fundraiser, Marjorie offered to do some local drawings. So she did a series of 12 drawings depicting the buildings in their current state or copied from photographs. She was able to capture them for the future as most are now lost. Uh, we've got the John Arndt, the Shantz House, which we have out front here, um, downtown Pemberton, uh, and John Arndt, hopefully we'll have a rendition of that coming up soon. 
And it really did, I think, uh, have a piece of history for Pemberton, because without these drawings, we wouldn't actually have a record of some of these buildings, as they would have been uh, lost over time. Marjorie uh, loved working with pen and ink, it was her favorite medium, uh, but she did work with pastels and watercolors, and she did enjoy working with them. This is a, a picture of her kitchen. So if you were ever sitting in Marjorie's kitchen, this is what you would have seen. Uh, that stove and the bread maker are two of my most favorite things. Um, here you have uh, the old fashioned bread maker. I love that thing, it's one of my favorite tools in the kitchen. Uh, and it was her stove that heated that house for a good many years. And uh, it was always a very warm kitchen, whether it was the food or her company. Uh, she was quite a, a lovely lady. Uh, the next slide here, you may notice a, a, a barn of recollection, the, the, uh, the Walker barn on the top right. Yeah. So uh, she did. These are part of the uh, the drawings that she had. I don't believe that barn is standing anymore. Um, but uh, a picture of Jeffrey and Winifred Downton at the Springfield Gardens in Lillooet, and then two again the Holy Rosary Church in Darcy, which I do believe has been torn down, uh, and Bill Ash's cabin. Uh, we do have a huge. There's like I said, there was twelve in that in that. Uh, series, but they did in fact have, uh, and we could do a slideshow just on those, I think. Uh, we did a couple museum uh, calendars, I don't think we've done one in the near recent few past, sorry, um, but uh, the museum does have all, all of her prints, but they are, it's nice to capture that. So we've got the uh, Don Miller Trap Cabin and the Owl Creek Hatchery. I'm not even sure if Patry's there anymore. So, yeah, they're really, you know, it's the end of the uh, those old buildings, for sure. I'm sure you have pictures of them. We do have uh, maybe another year when something interesting, more drawings. Um, and uh, sorry that it's a little bit shorter than most of our, our talks. Um, but on the uh, the end of it all, the the artists that we have in town are these are the historic artists, and I think moving forward, we have so much more art in in Pemberton, um, and it's such an area that has so much history and life. It, we just hope that we don't lose that. Um, so I know that. You know, we'd like to thank the, the, the artists that I was able to present on today. I feel like I, I rushed you a little bit, and I apologize for that. Um, we definitely have a lot of heart in this valley uh, when it comes to the art of the mountains. And uh, the techniques that they use, all very different, but all capturing the valley in itself. Um, the mountains, uh, these here are two of Marjorie's pastels. And when you look at every single one of their pieces of art, whether it's Rini, Pat, or Marjorie, the one prominent thing that comes to, to, to sight is the mountains. They've all captured the valley and the background of these huge, magnificent mountains, which I forget we have until we show up with friends from other places and they go, oh, wow. And you're like, what? They're like, outside. <laughs> um, and I think that's something living here we forget is in our backyard. Um, we kind of have to go away to come back and go, oh yeah, wow. Um, my office view is amazing. Um, but it is something that we forget. And no matter who they are or what kind of art they did, the one thing they do capture is how magnificent the mountains are. So. Moving forward, one slide left. Um, we do want to uh, thank you for attending our Teen Tale program, and we do look forward to seeing you guys next year. Um, and thanks to Pat Wilson, Rini, Ronan, and Marjorie Gans for being amazing artists. And hopefully, next year we'll have. And I know.
it's a little shorter today, being our last tea and tail, and I talk really fast. Um, I'm working on that, but genetically I don't think that's going to change much. Um, but if you have any questions, like Nikki was saying, I do a lot of genealogy, so in this area, um, I know that a lot of people have questions or anything like that. I'm always here um, for answering anything. Um, I, I don't charge for conversation, that's for sure. Um, and I think something that's really important is to, uh, as I was saying, write stories down. You know, I mean, researching these guys, Pat Wilson in, in particular, was quite difficult and the only reason I was able to really track him and where his family was from was because of his military records. Um, he did all his gorgeous paintings but he never wrote anything down. Uh, Rini was a journalist and she wrote lots but she didn't tell us anything about herself until she wrote Beyond Garibaldi. So really, you know, we have, you know, moving forward is write it down. <laughs> we are history for the future. So. I think that's something that, you know, take that away and, and say, you know, we may not be artists, but we are artists in our own life. So we hope that these guys, they shone a little light on the valley for us, and uh, hopefully uh, we can do that for the future. So, thank, thank you. you. Have a good day, guys, and thank you for being here.